Dear all, my name is Meir Sargian. I am heading China and Russia Council for Political and Strategic Research and teaching at Russian Army University. I am also Asia Global Fellow at Asia Global Institute of University of Hong Kong. Today we will speak about Asia Pacific region. The question arises why we need to discuss Asia Pacific region. And the answer to this question is that, that Asia Pacific region uh, has stood one of the main political and economic engines of, of, of uh, modern world. Here we have China and here we have India, which are playing a very important role in the era of changing world order. Such great power uh, like Russia, uh, the US, uh, mentioned about their power towards Asia Pacific region, I would say Indo Asia Pacific region. And here we have also middle powers like, uh, like Japan, like South Korea, and others which are playing a very important role. And we must also mention about Russia as uh, one of the main organizations in this region. Of course, uh, great powers and middle, middle powers are very important, but uh, here small states are also playing a very, very crucial role. And today our uh, speakers will focus on uh, small states. It is my pleasure to invite uh, Asanta Seneviratana, uh, who is currently work as a lecturer attached to the Department of Strategic Studies at General Sir uh, John Kotevala Defense University. Uh, uh, this university is in Sri Lanka. He is uh, also a PhD candidate at the Department of International Relations, University of Colombo. Dear uh, Mr. Asanta Seni Virata, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll share the presentation first. Uh, uh, it's on geopolitics of China's relations with South Asia in the 21st century, the foreign policy implications for small states uh, in South Asia. Uh, and uh, then I would like to thank you, uh, thank the uh, uh, university in Armenia for inviting me. Uh, for this uh, giving me opportunity in this important uh, workshop. Now, uh, to give you an introduction uh, to uh, discuss about China's uh, influence in South Asia, uh, we have to understand the geography and geopolitics in the region of South Asia. So, it's a unique region uh, with a unique geography and a uh, uh, unique geopolitics. Then uh, we have to understand the nature of uh, China-South Asia relations in the 21st century. Uh, Chinese influence is growing with the uh, economic rise of China. Uh, certainly within the South, region of South Asia, the Chinese uh, influence is growing. So I will discuss uh, so the possible implications uh, for the uh, small states in South Asia, uh, as well as what are the options in, in foreign policy we have. Uh, to face this uh, situation. Uh, then, uh, political geography in South Asia, I told you, uh, it's a very unique region. Uh, now, India is the largest country in the uh, region of South Asia. It's a very large country uh, compared to other countries. Uh, it represents, uh, uh, you know, averagely 75% of the land size, the population and the economy uh, in the region of South Asia. Uh, this itself uh, makes uh, India the regional power in South Asia and also add to that uh, India is centrally located within the region except for Afghanistan uh, India has boundaries land boundaries uh, with uh, many countries and with Sri Lanka and Maldives India has a maritime uh, boundary and also India has strong ethnic linkages uh, with the countries the South Asian small states but uh, when we discuss about India's role as a regional power in South Asia, uh, there's an exception related to Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan uh, is a, you cannot identify as a small state, it has its weaknesses, but due to the unresolved issues with India, uh, it it's, uh, have uh, developed military capabilities that are very strong. Uh, and it has uh, deterrence capabilities against India. And if you take Afghanistan, is the only exception in South Asia that India is not the most influential country uh, in the South Asian country. So all other small states in South Asia, 
India is the most influential country. But in the case of Afghanistan, it's Pakistan. And at the same time, Pakistan has a boundary with Afghanistan. Uh, India does not have a boundary uh, with the Afghanistan. Uh, if you see the map of South Asia, the political map, you can understand that uh, India is very centrally located. Uh, uh, historically, it has very deep cultural, ethnic link with all the countries in South Asia. Uh, and uh, it has a boundary with uh, each and every country except uh, Afghanistan. Historically, uh, they have had uh, special uh, agreements with Nepal, Bhutan when it comes to security. Uh, India played a major role when Bangladesh was created in 1971. Uh, India uh, intervened in Sri Lanka in 1980s, uh, also in Maldives. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's not a only a regional power, it's a, it's a regional hegemon as uh, well. Now in this context, we have to think about the China's relations with the South Asian uh, countries in the 21st century. Now in the 21st century, uh, China is uh, becoming, you can say, already a global economic uh, superpower. Uh, with, their, uh, with their economic growth, uh, in the beginning of the 21st century, now they have started this Belt and Road Initiative where most of the South Asian countries have become a partner to the Belt and Road Initiative. Here also there is an exception. Uh, India is not part in the Belt and Road Initiative. They have brought out a legal argument uh, saying that uh, one of the components of the Belt and Road Initiative that goes connect to Pakistan, uh, comes to Pakistan into the Indian Ocean, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor violates India's uh, territory because India uh, claims the whole of Kashmir, though Pakistan administrates and China administrates some of the regions. Highlighting that fact, India is not part of uh, China and obviously uh, China and India is sort of rivalries uh, in the 21st century. Uh, but for the South Asian countries, small countries, since they are weak and also economically underdeveloped, uh, the Chinese funds and development assistance are very important. Uh, in recent times, China has um, uh, uh, given uh, loans, funds, investments uh, in large scale uh, in, in South Asia. If you, if you consider Sri Lanka, many of the port developments, road developments are undertaken by the Chinese uh, uh, companies. At the same time, in Bangladesh, uh, even uh, in countries like uh, Nepal and Bhutan, it's, it's very much visible. Um, and also, uh, China is very supportive uh, to the countries for there are many of the say like problems that they face in the international forums like you know in Sri Lanka's case after the end of the civil war they have been pressure itself from the western countries uh, uh, in these cases China has uh, come forward uh, uh, to help Sri Lanka India cannot play such a role due to the ethnic linkages that uh, India has uh, 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 due to the you know what happened Tamil population in Sri Lanka, uh, and uh, uh, but again the most important relations in the South Asia again is China Pakistan relations that is different to the China's relations that it has with the other small countries in the region. Definitely, it's very strategic. Uh, it is uh, one K can say it's maybe targeted at India, it's strategic security relations. Uh, at the same time, uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor will improve the strategic relationship between Pakistan uh, and China. That is a major worry uh, for India when uh, looking at the China's influence from a regional power perspective. Now, uh, this is the Indian worry in the 21st century. Uh, uh, which was uh, bought by, of course, by the uh, some U.S. energy company um, in 2004-05, uh, highlighting that China, under the Belt and Road Initiative, is building uh, infrastructure projects, especially the port developments uh, in uh, countries that uh, surround India, uh, like a string of pearls uh, in uh, Myanmar, in uh, Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, in, in, and in Pakistan. Uh, the argument is that in the future, 
uh, scenario chinese uh, will develop this uh, you know infrastructure development into a greater strategic uh, 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 strategically important uh, you know places uh, possible chinese bases uh, is been discussed uh, military bases so from an indian point of view india cannot allow this to happen uh, uh, because it's the region region and it does not want to be contained by small states uh, around uh, uh, located around india so india is reacting uh, to these developments especially in the 21st century and of course uh, the growing uh, border tensions uh, between india and china uh, have also contributed immensely to this factor that india is taking uh, uh, many actions uh, as a reaction to the growing chinese influence uh, in the uh, countries in the south asian region uh, but from a chinese point of view what they say is uh, this uh, infrastructure development goes along the line of uh, uh, the, the maritime silk route uh, they say it is to uh, develop economic relations uh, with the south asia and rest of the uh, in the rest of the Asian countries, uh, uh, it not targeted at India and also what they say is they have a legitimate right to develop infrastructure along the supply line. So China, uh, which the, the, the oil uh, and uh, uh, gas, these petroleum resources goes through Indian Ocean uh, towards China, one of, uh, so they have to protect this. Uh, and at the same time, uh, while doing that, they can develop uh, economic relations with these countries. So China highlighted that fact uh, and has uh, uh, invested uh, in a strategically important projects uh, in the uh, in the re many countries in the region of South Asia. But now again, uh, the the problem from an Indian point of view is that some of the projects are very uh, strategic uh, in nature, especially when if you. Uh, look at Sri Lanka, China has invested in deep water uh, ports uh, like the port of Hambantota and they control uh, uh, important uh, uh, conti uh, you know, uh, uh, parts of the port of Colombo. Uh, they are building a port city project uh, in, in Colombo. Uh, from Indian perspective, most of it in India has transshipment happens to the uh, port of Colombo in Sri Lanka. So, the, the mega Chinese presence uh, is a sort of a body uh, to India. Uh, then uh, uh, India's reaction, uh, uh, their reaction uh, is uh, two ways. One is uh, they are having their own strategically important projects. You have one uh, minute, in South one, one, yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, in Sri Lanka, to uh, you know, compete with the Chinese Indians are invested in the port of Colombo. Uh, and other import infrastructure projects, uh, same in, in Bangladesh, uh, in uh, Nepal and Bhutan. Um, and at the same time, they are cooperating with the US, Japan and Australia on the Quad or uh, IPS in the Pacific strategy to counter the uh, growth, you know, the, the influence of China, especially in the South Asian countries. Um, India is very much interested in uh, strategically important projects. Uh, throughout the countries in uh, South Asia, especially the small states. Uh, as a conclusion, what are the options the small states have? Again, Pakistan is an exception uh, here. Um, understand the position, uh, the India's position within the region, because uh, in a way, the small states in uh, South Asia are dependent on India to a greater uh, level, so th that has to be always kept in mind. Uh, maintain economic relations with China and avoid strategic initiative that antagonize the strategic committee uh, in India. This kind of incident took place in Sri Lanka in 2014 when the Chinese President Xi Jinping came to Sri Lanka uh, for the, the you know laying the, the, the foundation stone for the Port City project. Two sign nuclear submarines visited Colombo that didn't go well uh, in the Indian strategic committee. Uh, at the same time, uh, what we can do is we can he do hedging. Uh, we can show both India and China, these are large companies in both countries are ready to invest. We can use that as a you know, sort of a competition to attract investment from both countries. Uh, because uh, China and India is growing uh, uh, 
uh, past in economic uh, sphere. So we can, rather than making it a challenge, we can make an opportunity. Uh, uh, and but it's very important to maintain no enemies, only friends, foreign policy because uh, uh, external balancing is not an option for country, small states uh, in South Asia. So uh, uh, with that, I would like to uh, conclude my presentation. Uh, I would uh, be open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. At first, we will have all speeches, and after, we will collect questions. And the next speaker is Selim Ilmas, who is doctoral researcher in the School of uh, Politics and International Relations at the University of Nottingham. Dear Selim, the floor is yours, please. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Selim Ilmas, a doctoral researcher in the School of Politics at IR um, at the University of Nottingham. And before I start with my presentation today, I would like to use this opportunity to um, thank IPSA and also the Russian Armenian University for organizing um, the conference. Despite all the uncertainties we have faced in the past two years, um, oh, okay. So the topic of my presentation, as you see, um, is related to the state behavior of small states. And I will draw on the case study of Malaysia in the Belt and Road Initiative um, with the help of the theoretical perspective of offensive realism. Um, although some or many scholars even um, regard realism um, as a theory that neglects the behavior of the weak or small states, I would argue that as states in the anarchical international system, um, they are also trying to survive and have relative security, as it is also essential for their own stability um, and also to become powerful. Um, and hence, smaller states also need to gain and maintain power. Um, they only have less concentration on the power sources and that is also perceived as um, aggression by some other states in the, in the system. Um, before, before moving to the empirical part, I would like to first explain some uh, misunderstanding that others might have with realism and also with offensive realism more accurately. Um, many scholars have pointed out that the great powers and rising powers um, remain the focus of the theory, um, but I think we shouldn't forget um, that Rome, for example, was not built um, just in one day. I know we know the sentence, but there is some truth behind that. And great powers were also once among the small powers before they took chances to rise. So in this case, um, it is actually interesting to look at uh, some cases and it might be more accurate to say that realism paid more attention to, um, to the aftermath of small states. This also means that um, the future of great powers can be among the small powers nowadays. So we can see the potential use of realism in this context then. And this leads also to my second point, that there seems to be a clear dichotomy to classify states in the international system as um, small and great powers. But the truth is small states are not alike. Um, they have differences in strengths and weaknesses, also due to their geographical location, as we have seen from the first presentation. Um, but for great powers, they often have a set of certain attributes and are strong in similar powers. So some can argue that due to the differences, small states do not easily get into conflicts or tension as the great powers do. They have simply clearer enemies, competitors and adversity. But I would disagree here. And in demonstrating offensive realist um, perspective, I argue that small states also want to see security, survival, power in the international system, just like the great powers. But because of the vulnerability, they cannot easily achieve that. So the rise of small powers is a strategic process and the relations with great powers and other similar um, small states become the key point here then. Um, the types of power uh, may not be initially focusing on military only, but small states are evidently comparing themselves with their similar counterparts, um, possibly in the same region. 
we cannot detect the intention of others, as realism would argue, so the system is characterized by uncertain intentions. And in this case, detention of the great ones can become an opportunity. Um, so small states will also help and protect themselves by switching their behavior according to the situation. And in a nutshell, um, small states can be analyzed with the logic of offensive realism. The reason why it has been neglected was maybe because the competition of smaller states could not easily trigger a world war. Um, so scholars did not prioritize them. But the theory can, uh, can be applied in no. um, Yeah, so, so then I am interested um, in the various behavior of Malaysia um, that it takes under different circumstances, different situations, and whether the theory of offensive realism as laid out just now can explain the behavior of small states in the international system. So, in this case, my thesis is that small powers compete with other um, states of similar power in the region um, in the ways that is beyond or outside of the military and aggression, and because they are also interested in power, and also um, in situations where great powers have conflicts or tension, for example, US and China, or US and, um, or China and India, um, it is more likely for small states to gain power by using these opportunities of the changing unstable relations. Um, and I will explain that later a bit more. So, to talk about Malaysia as a small state, um, it has also strengths and weaknesses, of course. And one of the significance of Malaysia to other great powers, it, um, it is the geographical location. To China, for example, it is the most important and arguably the fastest energy transportation route um, for fuel and other natural resources. And for India, it is the entry to the Indian Ocean. Um, and for US, it is a pivotal state for the region of Southeast Asia and a key to influence other ASEAN countries. And economic-wise, Malaysia is a big export country and aims to become a developed country by 2025. So it is also one of the founding states of ASEAN as known um, in the regional organization. And Malaysia has also its own military force, um, but it's not really considered to have uh, um, tension between, uh, between the great powers. And in terms of methodology, um, to keep it brief due to time, so it, I have used the process tracing and I've looked at the Sino Malaysian relations since the start of the BRI, since 2013, and especially on the external behavior of Malaysia in the region um, with China. And I've also conducted um, research, uh, including the, the presidential speeches, the events that took place, and the agreements and reports. So all of these are taken into account. Okay, so um, what kind of projects and activity does Malaysia have with um, China and which role does it actually take in the BRI? As mentioned, the geographical location of Malaysia um, manifests actually the importance to China's BRI, um, as we can see, uh, because it is the closest route to the Maritime Silk Road to export but also import um, from Asia um, with the rest of the continent. And especially Europe and Africa are important for the fast delivery of goods. So it is clear that Malaysia's role is, um, is crucial to China. Um, and we can also see the main projects focus on developing cities, railways and ports. And I think that is all known. So but it is more important to ask the question, what does it tell us? Um, the relationship between China and Malaysia is slowly developed since um, since the 1970s, and China's power also highlights the opportunity that Malaysia could obtain in developing its own nation. Um, so with China's development, Malaysia will be also one, one might argue that. Um, yeah. So the natural behavior to the BRI, um, as Mirshan uh, would argue, or as argued, um, for small states like Malaysia to would be to bandwagon with the great powers, including a lot of unfair agreements. So the bandwagon state will have um, uneven or unequal 
day compared to the um, compared to the state that are doing these projects like the BRI. Um, but that, that, this is nothing new. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So um, you have, we have to understand that, um, the situation can change, and Malaysia has also um, understand or understood this opportunity for its own um, location pertinent to India, US and China as, as uh, mentioned at the beginning and also to other powerful states um, such as Japan or even to the European Union. So as the West have, um, has largely criticized the debt trap diplomacy um, that China uses or has aimed from the beginning maybe, we could argue about that, um, but in deeper sense they have also provided unintentionally or even intentionally an excuse and the backbone for Malaysia to renegotiate the terms in the BRI and have since um, decreased the disadvantage in the deal. So now it's not anymore so strongly uneven. They are maybe now on the same level to have equal gains with China. Um, yeah, and in this case I would argue that states are also acting in a self-help way, in a self-help manner, to have survival through increasing their own power and they're also taking all the opportunities. Do you say the, the last, last, the last one, minute, please, in okay. your conclusion? Please. Thank so you. Right. Um, yeah, so, and this has led, um, and this was only possible because of the tension that was existing between US and China as we knew the trade war. So Malaysia made use of this because they knew this geographical location is important to, um, to China, especially the Strait of Malacca. Okay, so, and in conclusion, again to re-emphasize everything, I argue that the case of Malaysia is a lesson for small states where they can help themselves to get out of a potentially risky situation and, and they are balancing sometimes with the powerful states and sometimes they are bandwagon um, with the powerful states and we have to understand this only possible because of the um, multipolar international system. If it were a bipolar system then this would be difficult for the small states to switch between balancing and bad regular behavior. Um, this is where I conclude and thank you very much. Dear Mr. Yilmaz, thank you very much for your interesting speech. And uh, dear all, it is my pleasure to invite Mr. Uh, Kaur Singh. He is a Meritus Fellow, Professor of South Asian Studies and former Director uh, of South Asia uh, Studies Center at the University of Rajasthan, uh, Jaipur, India. Uh, dear sir, welcome. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mayer. Uh, let me at the out outset congratulate uh, Dr. Ruben for organizing the workshop against all odds of, uh, created by the pandemic. And uh, Mr. Ashanta and Salim have made my uh, task easy because they have set the background of my uh, ideas and presentation. If we see this uh, Asia Pacific region, there are three sets of small states. First are the island states, second, the uh, landlocked states, and third, uh, the states which are connected to sea and the land route both. And all these states have their own vulnerabilities. Some of the vulnerabilities are common in all the states. Others are specific to specific states. South Asian region is a representative of the Asia Pacific uh, small state vulnerability. Because South Asia harbors landlocked states, island states, and connected with both. Uh, uh, to both uh, land uh, route and the sea route. So South Asia is the representative of Asia Pacific. But uh, that is not my purpose to uh, analyze and uh, put a, an insight into that. If we see, <coughs> I have a strong belief that Armenia and Sri Lanka have a similarity in terms of their geographical location, in terms of conducting the relations with the big states and the small states. But Armenia we have discussed in the morning session. 
So in case of Sri Lanka specifically, how Sri Lanka is vulnerable and how Sri Lanka has conducted a diplomacy, exhibited diplomatic competency and negotiating skill to enhance its security, to pursue its development path, to uh, maintain its independence and secure rightful place in, in the Committee of Nations and thereby to uh, sustain the strategic autonomy. So how Sri Lanka has exhibited the competency and the skill, uh, the Sri Lankan diplomats particularly, that should be looked into while talking about the small state politics and small states and uh, understanding and the dealing with the big states as well as small states. Yeah. So if we uh, look at the Sri Lankan case, uh, Sri Lankan foreign policy in the post-colonial period can be understood into different phases. The first phase goes for, for three decades. And at the, like, the seven, late 70s, Sri Lanka became the first South Asian state to embark on LPG, liberalization, privatization, and globalization. And it was expected that Sri Lanka will lead the South Asian countries in economic development. A sort of optimism was created um, by the late 70s. But that sort of optimism had turned out as nightmare when the ethnic rights dropped out, and that ethnic problem a uh, violent dimension of the ethnic problem went on for decades. Then the 80s were, I should call the decade, dangerous decade in the Sri Lankan history, when India and IPK were sent, and the Sri Lankan nationalism was reinvented, while the Sinhala and the Tamil youth, uh, extremist youth came together against the Indian IPK, and so many things went on that day. I need not repeat here now. Then the 90s was a decade almost as a, a indifferent because India did not take any interest in the Sri Lankan affairs and do, other countries did not take much interest and even Sri Lanka did not invite others. Sri Lanka tried to solve its own problems on its own. But when uh, as the Devoda government came in power in India, uh, Indra Kumar Gujral in that government there was a sort of uh, Gujral doctrine. And there the Indian policy towards Sri Lanka and towards other South Asian countries changed a little bit and it is known as Gujral Doctrine to overcome the, any sort of uh, misunderstanding between India and India. Then the Sri Lanka, and the, and the, by time of the century, Sri Lanka pursued it to deal with the ethnic problem and the uh, later on the Sri Lanka could overcome this problem. So I did not describe all these things but Sri Lankan diplomats and Sri Lankan negotiating skills are somewhat better than the other smaller, smaller states. So when I, I combined all these uh, pages of Sri Lankan uh, and competency and the negotiating skills, I think there are three different frameworks in which we can understand. First is the ideological framework, when India and Sri Lanka remain together the non-alignment, the regional approach, and uh, the special place to India, China, and uh, UK. Uh, this, these are the common component in all the phases of say, uh, Sri Lankan foreign policy in the post-colonial period. So the second first is the uh, uh, ideological framework. The second is the state-centric problem remember every state tries to pursue its own interests, sometimes scrupulous, sometimes unscrupulous, some, sometimes enlightened interest. So how Sri Lankan state could pursue its interest, how Indian state and the Chinese state or the UK state pursue their interest in the Sri Lankan situation. And then the civilizational approach. And in terms of the civilization, civilizational approach, quite often the Sri Lankan leaders did explain the situation that in, with India we have close relations like relative, that sort of I should call the a sort of uh, organic and kinship kind of relations while China, Japan and other countries are, are our friends. This is the Sri Lankan 
a perception of them dealing with different uh, states, whether big or small. So, from that point of view, if we are in a particular framework, then we will have a different picture of the Sri Lankan vulnerability and how Sri Lanka overcome this vulnerability. If we have a different perspective, then there will be a different situation. So, Sri Lanka tried to cultivate relations with all the countries, China, India, United States, and sustain its strategic autonomy. Which I think if we compare with uh, Armenia, there can be very interesting trends can come up if we compare with Armenia, how the Sri Lanka could sustain its uh, strategic autonomy and there can be mutual lessons for Armenia and Sri Lanka that is a foregone conclusion. In future, we can think over that uh, aspect. But <clears throat> Sri Lanka tried to sustain uh, its strategic autonomy. Sri Lanka has the guts and courage to say United States that we are not ready to accept your MCC projects and the Millennium Challenge Corporations. At the same time, Sri Lanka entered in agreement with United States in so many uh, areas like uh, SOFA and uh, the acquisition of cross-servicing agreement and so many agreements Sri Lanka entered with. But when the Sri Lankan interest came, Sri Lanka stood against the MCC. Similarly, recently about the game, Organic fertilizers, when the Chinese companies sent the consignment, Sri Lanka refused both that and entered organic fertilizer agreement with India. So Sri Lanka has sustained its strategic autonomy while dealing with all the countries. I think it is the success. Most of my Sri Lankan friends are quite open are not agreed with me. We are in competency and uh, uh, negotiating skills. We are, but still, I am very optimistic Sri Lanka is doing fine. I think the Sri Lankan example can be emulated in others, in case of other smaller states. These words, uh, and Professor Mayer and uh, colleagues, I uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, dear all, I want to provide an opportunity to Mark Inra. Uh, Mark Inra is a corporate lawyer and your political analyst. He primarily works on South Asia, specializing in Pakistan and uh, Baluchistan. And uh, as I understand, they wrote this uh, paper together with uh, Gauri Nurgar Roak. Uh, Gauri Nurgar Roak is a hydropolitics researcher focusing on transboundary river basins in South Asia, Southeast Asia and, uh, and the Middle East. Uh, she is the founder of the media portal Blogmania. So, uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, the floor is yours, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Kendra. And firstly, I would like to thank the Russian Iranian University and IMSA Research Committee for providing me this opportunity to present my paper. My paper. But this paper is co-written by Gori Mukhtar. And the topic for the paper is the analysis of viability of Kashmir as an independent nation state. Now, if you see Kashmir, Kashmir is divided in various regions such as India, Pakistan, and India, Pakistan, and China. And Kashmir, as we know in general terms and legal terms, encompasses the erstwhile region of the state of Jammu Kashmir. Now, if you see the, the population of Jammu Kashmir, it is around 18 million and it is a multi-ethnic region. It has a lot of uh, communities such as Kashmiris, Dogras, uh, Hunjas. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, but my, my, my co-author is saying that we cannot see the PPT. Yes, we have your PPT, please. Is there yes, a can you share it yourself? Do you have this? Dear Mr. Kinra, do you have your PPT and your, your notebook? Yes, Can you have. share it? Yes, Please share it. Should I start from my end? Please share it. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, I'll start again. 
Uh, my topic is about analysis of viability of Kashmir as an independent nation state. We can't hear your PPT. We haven't heard your PPT yet. All right, just a sec, please. But we are losing time, so. Can you see my yeah, yeah, yeah. now? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. So, the region of Kashmir, in all general and legal terms, encompasses the erstwhile state of Jammu Kashmir, which, are, which is at present divided in the region of Pakistan, India, and China. The total population of Kashmir is around 18 million, out of which around 12 million is in India, and 5 million is in Pakistan. Kashmir is multi-ethnic as India. It has a lot of ethnicities such as Kashmiris, Dogras, Ladakhis, Hanjis, etc. The total area of Kashmir, out of which around India has around 46%, Pakistan 35%, China 19%. The topography of Kashmir uh, is basically hilly. Uh, on the eastern side it has the Himalayas as well, but it is also has a plateau of Ladakh. Uh, even the, the climate is uh, is varied because it's a very big uh, area. It has uh, both subtropical and temperate climates. Kashmir has a lot of rivers, lakes, and glaciers, and is considered as actually one of the most beautiful places on earth. Kashmir is rich in natural resources. It has huge deposits of gold, copper, iron, and even uranium on the Pakistani side. Kashmir has a huge potential of hydroelectricity. In India has developed around eight hydroelectric dams. Pakistan has developed around four hydroelectric dams in one. And it has still and it has still has the capacity to go for more. Now when we talk about you know trying to understand the viability of Kashmir as an independent nation state, we have uh, we're studying this uh, course from two parameters, theoretical and empirical. On the theoretical side, uh, Basically, when we talk about nation state, this is a this is a very new concept, a modern uh, modern concept, which was proper, which was basically promulgated after the West India Treaty. And one of the current examples of a modern nation state in South Asia is Bangladesh. Now, when we talk about Kashmir as an independent nation state, we try we have tried to study that through two theories: the social contract theory and sovereignty. The social contract theory, as promulgated by Thomas Hobbes, the English philosopher, talks that uh, a social contract based on thought the approach has to be uh, governed by the monarch because people in general are brutish. Uh, and in case of law, it is generally the people who has the natural rights and they want a government to govern them and it can be overthrown. While in case of uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, for uh, some of the current examples in case of modern era can be Saudi Arabia, China, while in case of law, it is India and United States. Now when we talk about the sovereignty theory, uh, Thomas Hobbes is, is all in all for a monarch which is sovereign and uh, in case of John Jack Hooser, another French philosopher, talks that people have, people will be the sovereign and they have all the power. And it is the government which is a mere agency to enforce the laws. Now, we, now when we analyze both con social contract theory and sovereignty, we can understand that it is only partly followed. Because in case of Kashmir, when the king, when the Maharaja of Kashmir or the king of Kashmir, uh, Mr. Hari Singh, he signed the instrument of accession with India because uh, because it was invaded by Pakistan. Uh, it was only half done, and after that, India approached the United Nations to go for a plebiscite. But that plebiscite has never happened until now. What, uh, so uh, that is the case with Kashmir. And when we talk about from the sovereignty aspect, now, even after, even after 72 plus years, the region is divided between India and Pakistan, uh, and the population has adopted themselves accordingly. Elections have happened in both these, uh, in both, in both these regions, and they have different structures. And people have voted and, and gone forward and elected their governments in their own respective regions. There also, uh, which also show, which also shows that there is some kind of diversive approach 
of or of divided opinions with respect to independence of, of the state of Jammu or of the state of Kashmir. Now, I will conclude my theoretical approach over here. Now, I would like to call in my my co-author, Ms. Gauri Mukharjee, who will be explaining the theoretical approach. Uh, sorry, the empirical approach. Thank you, Mark. Thank Free you for inviting me. Can you please click keep the slides? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the empirical approach we have uh, looked at four parameters as prescribed by the Montevideo Convention. Uh, first one being permanent population. So uh, based on this parameter, Kashmir has a strong precedence. It has had a stable um, population which has been residing there continuously for more than a millennium now. And uh, if you look at uh, their social makeup, it is multi-religious, multi-ethnicity. There are uh, 16 ethnicities. a uh, major ethnicities and multilinguistic so they also have 16 languages in their region so the makeup is a lot like uh, you know the indian society and uh, despite uh, being uh, you know multi ethnic and multi religious uh, they have retained their own identities and they have continued to coexist right since they were in uh, uh, they were part of ancient kingdoms to right now when they are divided between three states um the binding factors for kashmir are fewer uh, if you compare it with countries like bangladesh which is homogeneous in terms of language um largely in terms of religion and ethnicity and um this has also been uh, 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 you know multiplied by factors where they are divided in terms of geography and other things which we will see ahead and uh, this has uh, reflected in the population not being a continuous uh, variable anymore uh, next slide mark please so the next parameter is a defined territorial boundary so concrete political borders now for uh, most of its history uh, kashmir has seen a lot of shifting boundaries because they have been a part of different um, empires different kingdoms all through their history uh, not completely under control but not completely independent as well and it was really in the modern time that they uh, came uh, to you know were came under one uh, empire which was the dogra empire we will see that in the next section but um, the last one please last last one last one last one oh sorry um okay so we'll just move to the next slide uh, just basically the fact that the boundaries of kashmir are in dispute not within just within kashmiris but also within the different uh, three nations which are uh, dividing and governing next slide please government yeah so again kashmir has a strong precedence in governance it was a reformist and progressive state against under the dogra rule but now as uh, mark said there are separate elections held in both uh, indian and pakistan administ administered kashmir uh, there are different governing systems there are different laws and policy and that is why there is no one unification in terms of governance systems as well next your last statement please yes so uh, with the when these three uh, um, parameters are not fulfilled it is obvious that kashmir cannot have the capacity to enter into relations with other countries and that is also one of the prime meter of uh, being an independent nation state so uh, in conclusion we would like to say that since none of these parameters are being uh, uh, fulfilled and none of the theoretical parameters also not being entirely fulfilled uh, the viability of kashmir as a as an independent state does not stand in current times or even in the foreseeable future thanks thank you for uh, giving us a chance to participate in this conference thank you thank you, thank you. As the first, uh, using my capacity as the moderator of this session, I will give you blitz questions and I will uh, wait for your blitz answers. And my first question is for Mr. Asanta and uh, Mr. Karoli. I will give you United uh, question about about Sri Lanka. And uh, Mr. Asanta, uh, you are calling us from Colombo, from Sri Lanka, and there are many many. many misunderstanding and information in western media and contradictory information in 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 chinese media uh, western media is uh, trying to show that it was a debt trap because of sri lanka's debt uh, this uh, port of ambatoto appeared in the hands of china and chinese side is saying that uh, it is just for investing here and uh, getting benefits uh, for us and for sri lanka So, what is the opinion of Sri Lankan people scholars? 
and and uh, Mr. Gauri also, please, uh, at your part, please answer which kind of policy is India implementing in Sri Lanka for keeping its influence there? India and China is moving towards Sri Lanka. Please. Yes, thank you, uh, Doctor. Yeah, the Sri Lankan uh, view is that uh, we have to engage with China for the economic development. Uh, that debt trap uh, story is not 100% uh, true. Uh, you know, uh, Sri, Sri Lanka's external debt, the majority of the external debt is held by Japan, not by China. Uh, many countries, you know, West have tried to highlight we are trapped in a you know, Chinese debt trap, but it's number one, uh, you know, external, you know, uh, debt is owned by Japan, not China. Um, uh, what has happened is, in, in the Hambantota case, 70% uh, of the shares of the port have been given to China for a 99 year lease. But in that regard, there's a bit of an issue, why uh, give a play strategical import to port like that um, with 70% shares for 99 years? Uh, it would have been a better deal uh, than this. Um, it's not only debt. Sri Lanka was at that time, 2017, then they handed over the 70% of shares, was in need of the uh, foreign exchange. So the deal provided Sri Lanka with, with a large amount of uh, foreign exchange as well at that time. Uh, but the situation is continuing. We are not doing only with uh, China. Now, India very recently invested in Port of Colombo, 700 million US dollar investment, the Western Terminal. Um, India also interested in few strategically important projects. Uh, but in a way, uh, we give, you know, Chinese coming into Sri Lanka have uh, sort of created a competition. Now we see the, the US. Uh, and also Japan is very interested in investing in strategically important projects. So I think if Sri Lanka can manage this well, uh, we can get uh, good benefits out of it. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Kaori. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Mayor. Uh, Ashanka has uh, explained the Sri Lankan position that Sri Lanka is extracting benefits from India, China, and Japan. And Japan and India jointly are uh, developing the Podambu port. Uh, so, India's uh, policy towards uh, Sri Lanka is uh, rather accommodative and the liberal policy. If Sri Lanka is getting development assistance from uh, China, from Japan, from United States, or any of the country, it is not the problem of India because India alone cannot fulfill that with Sri Lankan developmental aspirations of infrastructure development and economic development. In, for India, the problem is when the facilities given by different to different countries by Sri Lanka, if they are determining India's strategic and security interest in Indian arms. Otherwise, India uh, uh, has no objection if Sri Lanka is getting support from uh, any of the country for in its developmental needs. So India is by and large accommodative, but in the past there have been problems because of their different uh, reasons like ethnic relations and of ways towards the Indian side or so. So that when the big country and small country relations are there, certain suspicions crop up over a period of time. If the big country is not taking interest in the small state's development, then big country is being accused that he is not concerned about the small states. If small or big state is taking excessive interest, more interest, then there will be some doubts about its intention. So this is the kind of dilemma between the small state, big state relations. Otherwise, India and Sri Lanka have almost model relationship which can be emulated in other parts of the world as well. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, and I will. Uh, I have a question for uh, Mr. Ilmas. I will. Uh, I will uh, speak shortly. Please give me your blitz short answer. Which kind of role Chinese China uh, Chinese diaspora in Malaysia is playing in Belt and Road Initiative for now? Thank you for the question. Um, as you as you point out, already there is a minority or diaspora community in Malaysia. And 
Um, I didn't focus on that in my research, um, but for my own observation, they are of course attracting um, the investments from China to Malaysia, and the investments, um, from what I have read so far, is also criticized because it is um, favoring the diaspora Chinese communities in Malaysia, but not the other ethnic minorities in Malaysia. So this also causes some tension within Malaysia in the population that the Chinese people are favorized or emphasized with the investment. This is what I can say. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Ilmas. And uh, my last question for uh, Mr. Skinner and Ms. Oak. Uh, in, your, in your title, you have mentioned an analysis of the viability of Kashmir as an independent nation state. Uh, please pay attention on the, the word nation. But uh, don't you think that it is a problem for Kashmir to, to create some nation state? Because it is a multinational region. And the most of problems are also going uh, because of some misunderstanding between the different nations. Maybe I am mistaken. Please explain us. Why have you uh, mentioned here nation state? Absolutely correct. Uh, you know, uh, and we believe that, you know, see, uh, although, you know, India is, uh, is kind of like a subcontinent and there are a lot of nations. Uh, but Kashmir in general, you know, we feel that you know it is difficult for them to have being a nation state because it's it's a lot, it's divided, not just in terms of uh, you know the boundaries, but also in terms of the people. And people are you know they're different. They think on different parameters, and they're divided on not on just basis of ideology, but also basis of religion. So that is why it's not just that you know it can't be. India is also multi ethnic, and you know it can it is a nation state. But in case of Kashmir, religion is also one big factor, and because of the divided contention, uh, you know, which has been happening for more than 75 years, it, it becomes more difficult. So that is why they say that it, it's difficult, you know, that Kashmir can become an independent nation. Thank you very much for your explanation. And do we have any question in the audience? Please, but keep it short. Please introduce yourself, and and after your question. Short question. And Hello. Short answer. Thank you for your uh, presentations. My name is Gore, PhD in economics. My question will be open for any uh, presenter who would like to answer who has experience in this topic. How do you think is Russia um, have some cooperation with uh, countries in the Asian region, from India to China and also small states, or Russia is out of the game? And second question, is Russia no, no, considered... No, one, please, just one, keep one question. Just one? Yes, yeah, short question. Yeah. Yes. yeah, continue, just continue this question. Uh, and if Russia can be sometimes considered as alternative to US or European Union to counter Chinese influence. Thank you. Mr. Singh, please. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, we cannot shun all the role of Russia. Russia has an important role to play. Whether Russians like it or not, whether the other countries of South Asia or the Asian countries like it or not, because Russia has some role to play. Because of this uh, historical legacy in the South Asian countries or in Asia, Asian countries, as regards the alternative to uh, U.S. in containing China, I think the present trend is all together different. U.S. perception is China and Russia are its rivals. Where the Iran and North Korea, they consider uh, them as uh, rogue states. So the Russia and China, they are more close to counter the U.S. influence instead of uh, countering Chinese influence, uh, Russia will go with the United States. I don't think it will be possible right at the moment and given situation of the global configuration. Right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. If not, I want to thank our excellent speakers for their very interesting speeches. Thank you very much. And all the best to you. Goodbye.